of the Bahamas <coughs> Carson and Peter Science Conference. And I would like the choir for the info. <laughs>
you now to stand as you are able for the call of worship. Our help is in the name of the Lord our God. We we make heaven and earth. Our salvation is in the Lord Jesus Christ. Who died for our sins and rose for our justification. Our confidence is in the Holy Spirit. Who enabled us to become God's children. The Lord reigns. Let the earth rejoice. Our God reigns. We shall be glad and wait for his word. And we continue as we sing the opening hymn. Number 258 from the VIP, my Jesus, I love thee, I know thou art mine.
of pardon, Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. Hear then the good news. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Amen. Amen. Thanks be to God. And now I'm going to praise him to render a few selections.
God is good. All the time. God is free. All the time. God, and all the time. God is good.
Amen. Praise the Lord. Thank you, praise team. We'll now call on Brother Charles Bridgewater, the circuit steward, Grand Bahama circuit, to bring welcome remarks. welcome his most pleasant task to perform. On behalf of our superintendent minister, <coughs> Reverend Alkeda Bryan Seymour, officers and members of the Grand Bahama Circuit, we are de delighted and pleased to welcome all present in the sanctuary, as well as those who tuned in via live stream. It gives us in Grand Bahama host circuit for this 2011 session of conference, and now the pleasure to welcome all of our ministers, some whom we've met before, and others for the first time, but new or not, our welcome is the same. Our conference delegates attended online, those in Grand Bahama attended in person, all invited guests. In addition to our social media friends, note, I did not say specially invited guests. That's mainly because in the eyes of Methodists, every one of you are special. Mm -hmm. uh, so we welcome our president, Bishop Theophilus Roar. Leader of the opposition party, <laughs> Pintar. <laughs> Members of Parliament, as well as any other government officials, ministers of the gospel from other churches, all of us who have accepted our invitation, to all we say thank you and a very, very warm welcome including those via media, <coughs> making this service important to us. Tonight, <coughs> members of the Grand Mama Circuit are excited, as this is the second time having one of our members serve as Vice President of the BTC Art District. <laughs> the highest position held by any lay person and I take this opportunity to extend best wishes and heartiest congratulations to you, Brother Bert. <laughs> and his beautiful wife. As I ask you to bear with me for a tiny little bit longer, as we personally recognize all present in support of our inductee. Can you please stand? Come to support my brother. It's also included our third son in law, Mr. Pinbar, the leader of the Majesty Royal Opposition Party, the Honorable Michael Pinbar. For all of us, I pray this service will be an added blessing on this cool evening. And again, I say welcome. Welcome all. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Circuit Stewart. At this time, we will have special greetings by family and friends. And we invite Honorable Michael Pintard Reverend Sobic Kemp and Reverend Kenneth Lewis in that order, after which the Grand Bahama Circuit Choir will render selection. I'd first like to pay respects to the Holy Spirit to all the officers and members of this church and by extension 
the Methodist family here in the Bahamas and Turks and Caicos. My task is very simple on behalf of our family to say a heartfelt congratulations to Papa. <laughs> So very briefly, let me just say rhetorically, what a man. There is a saying in the Bahamas for the generation that Papa hails from, that they don't make them like that anymore. And so my generation prays only to be the kind of man that he and the brothers and the sisters from this generation are persons who absolutely love God. Demonstrated not just in a service, but demonstrated in the privacy of their homes, in the relationship with his children, his grandchildren. What a man. I had the great honor of meeting Papa when I was smitten by his daughter. <laughs> and we had an opportunity to talk. And I learned invaluable lessons as Melba did, as all of his sons did, and as his daughter taught me. I learned that in his courting, he used to wear all white. <laughs> and so I wore white socks when I got married. <laughs> it may not have matched, but I had uh, the spirit of Papa with me. I learned how to ensure that there is peace and harmony in the home. Learn to diligently follow instructions. <laughs> and for this type of man, a man who is a king in his home, a role model in his home, he also knows how to submit when necessary. Papa has set an example for all of us in terms of how to live in a world where uh, people and things can be extremely difficult and complicated, but he has learned to be informed by the Holy Spirit, to exercise temperance in how he deals with others. It is very rare for you to see Papa bent out of shape. Most of you have never seen it. But he does get animated when his football team plays and mostly when they lose. <laughs> so he loves his God. He also loves family. He takes the time to sacrifice. Uh, one of the things that I say to those who call on him in order to get, how do we say this in English, financial assistance, and when a man passes 70, your role when you come to him is to come with something in your hand, not a request on your tongue. He has given all of his life to so many. He has given, even when he did not have it up front, he made a commitment, he found a way to bless others. Oh, what a man. And he's wise. He knows how to pick incredible women. <laughs> and he's a man of integrity. So he does it sequentially, not simultaneously. Colita was a gem to all of us. Who knew. He, she blessed us, but they blessed many. And now with Veronica, that ministry of service to people continue. He loves his family, all of his children, equally, his grandchildren, and even son-in-laws. <laughs> what a man. He loves his country. When you sit down and talk with Papa, it is easy for you to recognize the patriotism in this man. There's no xenophobia. He's not running around trying to fan the flames of them from other places versus us. He embraces all people, but he recognizes what is important and needed by this country. And he is unashamed to talk about it, to advocate for it. I'm blessed, our family is blessed, and 
And so it's an honor to be here, and thank you all for giving us an opportunity to congratulate and express our love for our Papa. And I believe that the Methodists will be served not only graciously, but competently by a man of integrity, a man who loves God, a man who exam exemplifies family values, and who's a patriot to the end. We love you, Papa. Superintendent Minister, it's a privilege indeed to be here during this specific conference. And I know that the presence of the Lord is with you, but I was most excited when I recently heard that my comrade, Brother Bird, is taking a step higher. As you know, it is said that the highest calling one can ever receive is that to be a minister of the gospel of Jesus Christ. For some reason, in these days, people seem to be putting that position down. But I want to encourage my brother today that you're taking a step up. He has proven himself as a businessman extraordinaire, a man of great qualities, a man who can be trusted, a man, as of course much has been said about him, but I had to be here this evening when I heard that uh, he was being honored in this way and he was taking this step. And so I'm truly privileged to be here. I'm well familiar with many of you, of course, Reverend Ken Lewis, the president of the Christian Council. Uh, we are all dear friends, and of course, Reverend Bishop Rowe. We've known each other for a number of years during his tenure here in Freeport. And so I'm truly delighted to be here. Behold how good and how pleasant it is for brethren to dwell together in unity. We may be of different walks in life. We may be of different denominations, different fellowship. However, we all exalt the name of Jesus Christ. Bless the name of the Lord. I felt the presence of the Lord here every time I come. I feel his presence. I give God praise and thanks for that. By the way, I'm still fired up from last Sunday. <laughs> Bless the Lord. The story, the story is not finished. Bless God. What a wonderful, wonderful message it was of God's faithfulness. And may God continue to take you to higher heights and deeper depth as you continue to seek to serve him in spirit and in truth. God bless you. Thank you so much. Good evening, everyone. Good evening. I am pleased to have known this wonderful and awesome man, Boyd Lyburn, for over 38 years. <clears throat> and I am honored to call him my friend. Over these many years, one of the things that impressed me most about birth is that he never changed. He's always been and remained the same quiet, unassuming, honest, sincere, dedicated, and committed person. A loving friend, a loving brother, I'm sure a wonderful husband, a wonderful grandfather, and a wonderful father-in-law. My brother Bert is generous, he's kind, and he is considerate. When I became superintendent of the circuit, Bert was my circuit steward. And we were facing some serious challenges, financial challenges. And we tried to figure out, Bert and I, how we were going to repair St. Paul's Methodist College. So I took Bert to the campus, and I said, Bert, we have to repair this campus. And when I looked at him, I could see depression in his face. 
He said, Rev, we ain't got no money. So I asked him, how much money do you have? He said, what do you mean? How much money do you have in your pocket now? <laughs> Put his hand in his pocket and he came up with some money. You know, boy, this is a good businessman as um, uh, Pastor Sobe Kemp said. He's a very good businessman. I knew boy had some money in his pocket. <laughs> so I, I said, boy, how much money you got? He pulled out $1,500. So I took out 2,500. I said, we're gonna start. And we started. And the rest is history. <laughs> See, Bert is someone who would never let you down. He's never gonna let the church down. He's never going to let people of God down. God has gifted this young man with skills and gifts necessary for this high office. And like the other appointments, the conference has chosen well. You see, Bert is not a novice. He's wise. He's quiet. Yet he is forceful. Now I know well, the Pentad said, we've never seen him angry, but I've seen it. <laughs> he's not afraid, and he doesn't back down. You see, like my mother of blessed memory used to say, still waters run deep. Bert has been blessed in so many ways, a beautiful family, and God blessed him a second time but a beautiful wife. My brother Bert will do well for this conference. He will make us all proud. And I stand before you this evening to ask you to join me as we place him before God, asking that God continue to favor him and shine his light upon him. I ask Almighty God to allow my brother Bert, to allow mercy, grace, and the immeasurable love of God to follow him all his days as he discharged his duties. God bless you, my brother Bert, and congratulations.
thank the Grand Bahama Circuit Choir. And we continue in worship with the Ministry of the Word. We will have the reading of the Old Testament by Jaden Lightburn, the granddaughter of Brother Bert Lightburn. Thank you, little sister Joyland, for leading us in the Old Testament lesson. And she read so well, eh? Yes. Very well indeed, very well indeed. At this time, we're going to call Brother Emmerich Seymour to lead us in the Te Deedam Ladamas. And we're going to stand and we're going to chant it. Well, we have our bishop here. He, he is the consummate chanter. Come, bishop, please.
darkness of death. Now let's open the kingdom of heaven to all. Excellent Gregorian chanter, I must say. <laughs> Thank you. At this time, we call upon Michaela Pintar, the granddaughter, another granddaughter of Brother Bert, to lead us in the epistle lesson taken from 1 Corinthians chapter 12, reading verses 1 through 11. Following which, we will have the gospel reading by the Reverend John St. Joseph. <laughs> This, the epistle reading is taken from 1 Corinthians chapter 12, 1 through 11. Now concerning spiritual gifts, brothers and sisters, I do not want you to be uninformed. You know that when you were pagans, you were enticed and led astray to idols that could not speak. Therefore, I, therefore, I want you to understand no one speaking by the Spirit of God ever says, let Jesus be cursed. And no one can say Jesus is Lord except by the Holy Spirit. Now there are varieties of gifts with the same Spirit. There are varieties of services with the same Lord. There are varieties of activities, but it is the same God who activates them all in, of them in every way. To each is given the manifestation of the Spirit for the common God. To one is given through the Spirit the utterance of wisdom and the other utterance of knowledge according to the same Spirit. To another faith by the same Spirit. To another gifts of healing by the one Spirit. To another working of miracles. To another prophecy. To another the healing. <clears throat> to another discernment of spirits, to another the various kinds of tongues, to another interpret interpretation of tongues. All these are activ activated by one and the same spirit, who belongs to each one individually, as the spirit chooses. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Stand for the reading of the Gospel. St. John chapter 17, verses 20 to 25. Glory to you, God. I ask not only on behalf of these, but also on behalf of those who believe in me through their word, that they may all be one as you, Father, are in me, and I am in you. 
May they also be in us, so that uh, the world may believe that you have sent me. The glory that you have given me, I have given them, so that they may be one as we are one. I in them and you in me, that they may become completely one, so that the world may know that you have sent me, and I have loved them even as you have loved me. Father, I desire that those also whom you have given me may be with me where I am, to see my glory which you have given me because you love me before the foundation of the world. Righteous Father, the world does not know you, but I know you. And these know that you have sent me, and I made your name known to them, and I will make it known, so that the love with which you have loved me may be in them, and I in them. <clears throat> this is the gospel of Christ. Praise be Christ our Lord. Sisters, just for a brief moment, if you can please be seated. Thank you, Reverend Lewis. My brothers and sisters, all people of God, Methodists across the Bahamas, Turks and Caicos Islands, Methodists across the eight district conferences of the Methodist Church in the Caribbean and the Americas, those who tune in by way of the live stream broadcast this evening. We welcome you as I join the circuit steward in extending words of welcome to all of you for sharing with us this evening in this high moment in the life of our conference as we have come here at St. Paul's Methodist Church in the Grand Bahama Circuit to induct our brother Bertrand Lightborn as the new Vice President of the Bahamas, Turks and Caicos Islands Conference. This year in our two 111th session of conference marks the 26th year since the inaugural conference of the end of the Bahamas Turks and Caicos Islands Conference. Out of the eight district conferences, this conference alone celebrates this high moment of recognizing a vice president. Thanks to the framers of our constitutional instrument, and it is certainly good to have in our presence tonight Brother Maurice Clinton, one of our legal advisors, Anthony Thompson, and this Sister Miriam Curling, and others who joined them. We were able to celebrate this moment in the Bahamas, Turks, and Caicos Islands Conference when none of our brothers and sisters across the Caribbean can do so because of the inaugural conference here in the Bahamas, Turks, and Caicos Islands Conference led by our sister, the Reverend Julia Williams, who served as the first vice president of our conference in 1997. 
uh, followed by uh, Brother Wilbur Kaling, Dr. Hugh uh, Fulford, and uh, Sister Judy Monroe, Sister Annette Poitier, uh, Sister Esther Joy Sargent, Sister Linda Dames, and uh, Brother Wilbur Cayley again served, and, and now we have entered that stage where our brother Bert will, uh, Arthur Chase, uh, please, yes, thank you so much, but Arthur Chase as well would have served as vice president, and now we enter the stage where our brother, uh, Bert Lightborn, takes the mantle in serving as our vice president of conference. I have had the distinct privilege and honor of working here in the Grand Bahama circuit and much of my time here, Brother Bert Lightborn served as the treasurer for many years at this St. Paul's Methodist Church. In fact, when I arrived in the Grand Bahama serving at St. Paul's, there were five distinct persons who basically everything went through here at St. Paul's. Brother Bert Lightborn, Brother Jacob Cooper of blessed memory, a Brother Martin Monroe, who is here with us this evening, Brother Bursell Williams of Blessed Memory and Sister McQuella Smith. Those five persons basically spearheaded much of the leadership here in this church uh, for many years. And Brother Bird played an integral role in the, that administration. I thank God for how he served with diligence, how he served with honor, how he served his church with such devoted service. And now he has offered himself to serve as the Vice President of the Bahamas, Turks, and Caicos Islands Conference. This is a proud moment, not just for Brother Bert or the Grand Bahama Circuit, his family, but a proud moment for our entire conference, that a man of the caliber, of the distinct gifts and graces which Brother Bert brings to the office of Vice President can serve us at this particular time. I believe by God's grace, as we seek to move our conference to a level of economic stability and viability that Brother Bert will play a vital role in bringing our conference to that next level. With the gifts and graces he has been blessed with by Almighty God, I have no doubt that our conference is in good hands as we move forward into the future. And so brothers and sisters, people of God everywhere, it is so wonderful for us to assemble in this service. This service also helps us to appreciate past vice presidents and also in the absence of our past vice president, Brother Wilbur Cayley, we've asked Sister Michelle Lynn Forbes Dames, past vice president of our conference, to do the honors this evening of leading us in much of the liturgy this evening uh, to induct the vice president. And so without any further ado, I'm going to invite Sister Michelle Lynn Forbes Baines to come, and she's going to do the introduction of the Vice President. Sister, please welcome her as she comes. Good night, my brothers and sisters in Christ. Good night. Let us please stand for hymn number 305, Behold the Servants of the Lord.
congregation to please remain standing. Kindly note that the Bahamas Church and Hades Islands Conference of the Methodist Church in the Caribbean and the Americas in its representative session held virtually on Wednesday, January 12, 2022, unanimously elected Mr. Bertram E. Lightborn to be the Vice President of our conference. Brother Bert, there was a time where I stood right where you are today and questions were put to me. And so my brother in Christ and fellow member of the Methodist Church of the Church. I got some questions for you. I got questions for you. I ask that you give answer to these questions, which in Christ's name and the name of the Church of the Bahamas Sus and Caicos Islands Conference, I now put to you. Having been appointed to the office by the conference, do you regard it as the call of God to you for service in the church? And are you willing to accept it as such? I do. Mm -hmm. Let me ask this question again to you, Brother Bird. <laughs> <laughs> Having been appointed to the office by the conference, do you regard it as the call of God to you for service in the church, and are you willing to accept it as such? I so regard it. I so accept it. Will you endeavor to fulfill the responsibilities and functions of this office as you shall have opportunity and as God's grace shall allow? I will so endeavor, God's Holy Spirit enabling me. And so now, I pray that Almighty God, who has put in your heart the readiness to serve in this way, fill you with grace and strength that you may accomplish your task. Amen. So, Brother Burke, in the name of our Lord, Savior Jesus Christ, the head of our church, we recognize you, Mr. Bertram E. Lightborn, as Vice President. And in token thereof, I present to you your BTCI Vice President Jewel. Your Bible, sorry, your Vice President's Bible. And also present to you your, B your BTCI Vice President, Jewel. By the way, this Jewel come heavy around the neck for a reason. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you carry the church. On behalf of the lay people, and sometimes the ministers too, we have them do that, yeah. But Brother Bird, we, Thank you for accepting this position. And I now declare you, Mr. Bertram E. Lightborn, to be inducted into the office of Vice President of the Bahamas Sus and Caicos Islands Conference of the Methodist Church of our MCCA. And in token thereof, I give him the Vice President Bible and I give him the right hand of fellowship. Brothers and sisters, this is a most auspicious moment, not just for Bert, but in the life of his family and this church, and we certainly are honored to congratulate him on this occasion. The Bahamas Turks and Caicos Islands Conference records its formal thanks for an appreciation of the devoted service and happy colleagueship offered by Mr. Wilbur C. N. Cayley in the office of Vice President 
and praise that grace, peace, and love from God the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit may abide with him throughout the coming days. We welcome and commend the Vice President, Mr. Bertrand E. Lightborn, to the guidance of Almighty God, and pray that the Holy Spirit will continue to anoint you for the service in his church. God bless you, Brother Bird. Let's give him a round of applause. <laughs> Congregation, can please be seated as we listen now to the response of our new Vice President. Good evening. Good evening. To Bishop Rule and to the officers of this great conference, to all of the ministers, and to all of the ministers of God who are visiting with us, to all the members of Parliament, Brother Michael Pintar and any other member of government. And to you, my brothers and sisters, here at St. Paul's this evening, they, they are poking me and they're telling me not to forget my wife. <laughs> I haven't been somewhere yet. <laughs> My lovely wife, Veronica. <laughs> to all of my family members who are here, good evening to all. I like to begin with a few words from St. Paul's Gospel, St. Paul's letter to the Ephesians. Chapter 1, verses 3 through 5. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ. According, according as he has chosen us, in him before the foundation of the world. And we should be holy and without blame before him in love, having been predestinated. I give honor and glory to God for being here this evening. And to our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, it is an honor and a privilege to be able to address, address you this evening during this very humbling experience. When they were talking about me earlier, I was looking around to see if they were talking about someone else. <laughs> because I didn't know all these things about myself. It is humbling that you of the conference have found me so worthy as to elect me as your vice president to serve this august body. I will endeavor to do the best I can to serve you with distinction. I wish to thank the officers and the delegates of the Bahamas, Turks, and Caicos Islands Conference for showing the confidence in me in electing me to this position. My journey to this day did not happen overnight. I am grateful to God to have had the opportunity to be encouraged and guided by some giants of the Methodist faith. Beginning with my dear mother, Susan Lightborn, 
she would, was a steadfast worker in the church for most of her life. She read all of her children and brought them up in the Methodist faith. I can tell you of the days of going to church in the mornings, Sunday school in the afternoon, and church at night. I enjoyed the Sunday school part because after Sunday school we could go out and play and rummage around the town. But the night service I did not like. Because every time I would wink my eyes, she would look at me. You know, in those days, the mother just have to look at you. They don't have to say anything. And then I'll put a toothpick in my eye and keep it open. But she was an angel. She served in the choir at Wesley Methodist Church in Nassau, Farm Road. It's the old Wesley Methodist. And then on at Rose Memorial Church, where she served there in the choir until her passing. I wish she was here tonight. She would have been proud. I also had an uncle who was a preacher in the Methodist Church. In fact, he ran the church at Matthew Town in Agua Bahamas for many years. His name was Joseph Henson. So I come from a long line of Methodists. I have been blessed and privileged to have worked with a number of eminent ministers here in Grand Bahama over the years. Permit me just to name a few. The Reverend Edmund L. Taylor, The Reverend Henry Perry, Dr. Livingston Malcolm, and the Reverend Dr. Emmy J. Weir. Now these two are very special to me because they always inspired me to push. They encouraged me to develop myself educationally, and also to take up the challenges of advancement throughout the church leadership. Every time I would see Reverend Malcolm he was a man with a lot of energy. What did I tell you last time? Why didn't you take up that position? If he was here today, <laughs> he would be right here pushing me. Reverend Ware had a quiet, demeanor, and he would pull me aside. I love them. They were always encouraging to do better. And they never settled for anything but the best. And they also congratulated you when you do well. And not just to me, but for a lot of the Methodists uh, brothers and sisters who have moved up through the ranks. I remember Reverend John Stubbs, Hillgrove Hamilton, and well, those two were fixtures here in the Grand Bahama Circus, very good friends of mine. The Reverend Kenneth T. Lewis, my friend and brother for many, many years, I worked closely with him during his tenure, and he told you about the experience at St. Paul's College. What he didn't mention was, we got the work started, and we finished the administrative building, we put the roof on, and we were very really proud of ourselves. And then I think it was Matthew King. <laughs> We went down there one morning and the roof that we just finished was across the street. So we had to roll up our sleeves and start all over again. We had some workmen 
working with us, and when Friday came, they went to Reverend Lewis for their pay. Reverend Lewis said, I don't see Brother Bird. <laughs> he didn't give me any money. <laughs> but you know, God, God found a way to pay those men. <laughs> but we had a very, very good working relationship. Reverend Lewis is a visionary. After Matthew came, all of our buildings were damaged. We had three churches, the manse and the school, they were all damaged. We all had roof damage. If you've seen this place, the roof was caved in and all of these walls were stained and the carpet and everything. The benches, everything was full of debris. It looked like a disaster area. And we pledged ourselves along with Brother Henry Seymour and we got the work done. So, to God be the glory. All of our buildings are doing well. St. Paul's School still needs work, but we are trusting God to finish the work on that building. But we are operating. Last but not least, our Bishop Theophilus Rowe. As he told you, we worked closely during his tenure here, but Reverend Rowe became very special to me and my family. You see, I had some very dark periods of my life. And Reverend Roll was a beacon of hope during those periods. Sometimes it was easier to give up. I would call him and he would pray and encourage. Sometimes he would say the word. I don't know how to do it because I kept on working and doing what I had to do. But it's good to keep busy when you're going through things like that. Reverend Roll was also there when the dark clouds disappeared and the sunshine came back into my life. I owe him a special debt of gratitude. I wouldn't be here if it wasn't for the grace of God. Amen. Great is thy faithfulness. I am thankful for my family members who stood by me who encouraged me, who lift me up when things are down. My one and only daughter, Bernice, she couldn't be here this evening because of medical reasons. Her husband, Michael, and my little darling, Michaela, my daughter-in-law, Melba, and my other darling, Jane. They're so special. My sister-in-law, Diane. We have a very small, very knitted together family here, immediate family. And we live like one. So I thank them for putting up with me. I thank them for supporting me in everything that I do. And I look forward to their support as we go further. I would, it would be remiss of me if 
I did not mention my deceased wife, Cornita. Her and Reverend Rule were very, very close. And it was her wrenching when she departed this life. But she was my prophet. She prophesied over many things that happened in my life. And I guess it's God's will that she's not here tonight. But I've been blessed. You know, God always sent a comforter. When Jesus was leaving, you know, he says, I'm leaving. He said, I will send a comforter. And God sent me another. just like having the same wife because she treats me like a king. I'd like to also thank my other family members. They're spread far and wide. Brother Morris Clinton out there, my cousin, my brother. We always talk about old times and we always talk about the old folk. I have a son in Canada and I have family scattered throughout the United States and England. I thank all of them for their well wishes and their support. I also thank all of the delegates and members of conference who are so special and who always encourage me and support me also. I see members from my Rotary Club here. We have our president, Neil Burrows, and one of our sisters, Sister Betty Williams. I don't see any others, but I thank God for them. Oh, Constance McDonald. Um, we call her the advocate for the club. She's a King's Council, you know. We're very proud to have her. Thank you for coming. To all of my special friends and brothers who, and sisters who came out to support me this evening, and to all the brothers and sisters in the Turks and Caicos Islands, I wish that we had a face-to-face -face conference. I know you would be here. So God bless all of you, and thank you for your well wishes. And to all the members of St. David's, St. Andrews, and St. Paul's, I thank you for your kind support over the years. The brothers and sisters, as we close, I would like for you to 
Continue to pray for us here in the Bahamas, Turks, and Caicos Islands Conference as we face the challenges of carrying out the work of God in the Bahamas and the Turks and Caicos Islands and beyond. God bless you and thank you. Thank you, Mr. Vice President, for your response. As I sat down, sit down around, and I look at Reverend Julia, Reverend Ken, Reverend Neely, and I just look at the other side, Reverend Wool, and the Vice President, I said to myself, you are really short. <laughs> but I am short and sweet. <laughs> receive your offering for the work of God, please give generously. And during that time, the choir will do a selection.
opportunity that you give to us to be here tonight. And as you come, Lord, we bring this offering to you. We ask you, oh Lord, to bless it and continue to bless your people. Help us, Lord, to use this offering for the well-being of your church. And we thank you. And we bless this offering in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Please remain standing as we receive our preacher for tonight, our past president of the BTCI conference, and superintendent minister of the unjust circuit, Reverend Dr. Raymond H. Neely. Let us clap our hands as we receive our preacher for tonight. Please said, Beloved in Christ, I invite us to sing the first and the last verses of the hymn which is printed following the sermon. Hark, my soul, it is the Lord, tis thy Savior, hear his word. Jesus speaks and speaks to thee. Say, poor sinner, loves thou me. First and last verses as printed. Because the hymn that we sang, My Jesus, I love thee. I know thou art mine for thee all the follies of sin. I resign. My gracious Redeemer, my Savior art thou. If ever, hallelujah, I love thee. My Jesus, tis now. And then I did some research on that hymn because the Lord was guiding me to look into this hymn a little further. And when I researched this hymn, I found that this hymn is rooted deep in Methodism. That the author of this hymn was a Methodist. And he went to St. John's United Church in Montreal, Canada. It was a Wesleyan Methodist Church in those days, but nowadays it's called St. John's United Church. And I look at the dates when he lived, when he was born, and when he died. And he lived for 27 years, and that impressed me that a man who said, my Jesus, I love thee, I know thou art mine, only lived for 27 years. And I did some further research. And when I found out the result of that research, it set my heart beating fast. Because I found out that when he wrote this hymn, he was a teenager 
of only 16, 16, 16 years of age, but he was determined from age 16 that he loved Jesus so much. If ever I love thee, my Jesus, tis now. And so as we come together tonight, it's not just for some mere social gathering of people from different parts of Grand Bahama or different parts of the Bahamas. It's not some mere social gathering to enjoy ourselves or to socialize together. This is a gathering of the people of the Holy Spirit. And we are here tonight under the anointing power of Jesus Christ, our Lord and our Savior. And my friends in Christ, as our Vice President spoke, and when he paused at a moment to gather himself, it seemed to me, and to reflect more deeply on what he was about to say. The words that I'm going to say to you came more forcefully to my mind. January the 15th, we celebrated, or some people celebrated, the birthday of a famous man, Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. And all of us know the story how one midnight he got a telephone call threatening him and calling him a very, very offensive name. And the boy said to him, you have to leave town and otherwise you're going to blow off your head and blow off your house. And he thought about his young daughter who was just a few days old, that she could be killed and taken away from him. And he got weak and he started to falter. But no matter how strong we are in the work of the Lord, sometimes we falter and we feel discouraged. We didn't know what to do. And he discovered then that he had to know God for the birth for himself. And he started to pray. Something said to him, you can't call on. Daddy, now you can't call on. Mommy, now you have to call on the God that they taught you about. And then the voice he said, as if a voice seemed to say to him, What I say to you, Brother Bert, tonight, Martin Luther King Jr., Bert Lightbone, stand up for righteousness, stand up for justice, stand up. The truth. Amen. Then he quoted the words of the king. I've seen I've seen the lightning flashing when the person can testify. Maybe there's some who never saw the lightning flashing. Maybe some never felt sin breakers, whoa, thundering in our souls, but he said, I've heard the voice of Jesus saying still to fight on for his promise never to leave me, never to leave me, hallelujah, 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 never alone. My brother in Christ, Brother Bert, tonight, I thank you for coming forth as a leader in the Methodist Church. You might have forgotten this by now, but right over there in the dining area, one conference a few years ago, you stood behind me. And you said something to me. I was president of the conference there. And you said something to me, you whispered something to me, a word of encouragement. And I always remember that word that you spoke to me. Tonight, my friends, the world has felt the lightning of 
COVID-19. Yes, yes, yes. Brown Bahama and Abaco in particular, they have felt the lightning and they heard the thunder roll of the results of global warming in such a way that they might never forget. But Psalm 24 tells me that Psalm 24 makes a declaration that even though COVID might be called a pandemic, and the meaning of the word pandemic is what? Worldwide. The word of God on which we stand declares to us in Psalm 24. What it says? That the earth Say, the earth is the Lord's, and the fullness is Lord. The people of the world and those who bear therein. We as a Methodist Church, we too have felt the lightning of the principalities and the powers yes. in our history. Mm -hmm. We have felt the thunder roll of spiritual wickedness. My God. In high places. Against the rulers. Hallelujah. I told someone recently, I'm too old to mince words now. <laughs> My time for mincing words it wasn't there before, but it's more so now. My time for mincing words is gone. That as a Methodist people, in the Bahamas and the Turks and Caicos Islands, we have felt the lightning rod of spiritual wickedness, not in low places, but in high places. We have heard and felt the thunder roll of the worldly powers, the worldly rulers of this world. But we have heard the voice of Jesus saying, still to fight on. Still to fight on, for he promised never to leave us, never to leave us alone. And the words of my text for tonight are found printed in the bulletin for tonight in Exodus chapter 33. Moses said to the Lord, and we go on in that same chapter where Moses says, Please show me your way. And then Moses goes on to say, God says to him, My presence will go with you, Brother Bert. And then Bert said to God, On the night when he was inducted, what Moses said to God, when God called him, he said, Lord, if your presence will not go with me, don't send me there. If your presence will not go with me, don't send me there. And then later on, Moses said in that same chapter, Lord, show me your glory. Show me your glory. Moses was a powerful leader, but he had challenges. Exodus is about the faithful God who has power to redeem his people. Amen. The people were stiff-necked. And once when Moses was on the mountain for 40 days and 40 nights, he came down and he found them worshiping counterfeit gods. These be your gods, O Israel, who brought you up out of Egypt, and they were bowing down under whose leadership? Aaron's. There is idolatry in the church today where people set aside the glory of God for the glory of idols. I'm not talking about Chemosh and Baal. I'm talking about gods more subtle than that. People like to talk about the sin of human, you know, that people choose the same kind of sexual lifestyle. And you preach about that, and you preach about that, and you preach about homosexuality, as if you mean that's the only way they know to preach about. And you preach about these days, 
and they go down to the, the food ship ports and the boat, they go when they come into the Bahamas. They preach against lifestyle choices of people as if the only sin was connected to sexuality. And meantime, in our own churches, we are persons who are committing idolatry because they're using certain things and worshiping other things as idols instead of worshiping the glory of God, our Lord and Savior. And there's a professor, scholar, Joseph Matera, and he spoke about the five signs of idolatry in the church today. He said there's the idolatry of celebrity of preachers. So celebrity and preachers. God has said the people worship the preacher. Do they worship the pastor? And if I ask a pastor, I'm enjoying that kind of celebrity, I better watch out lest I be like that king who gave my God the glory. When the people say, He's not a man, He's a God. And he gave not God the glory. Yeah. The idolatry of worshiping entertainment. That church too boring. Yeah. Methodists, we will never, we must never bow to that. Yeah. Then because you go someplace else and see them worshiping in a certain way, yeah. and they say the service was lit, yeah. and the service was high, and the service was this, and the service was that. Sometimes it's only noise and entertainment. Yeah, yeah. Worshipping the idol of entertainment is not giving God the glory. Yeah. Then some people worship the idol of personal prosperity. If God is to you, God is going to make you prosperous. And the idol of objectifying God. When people come to church when they want to feel the presence of the Lord, but they are not committed to knowing and loving the person of God. Our church, church is today, are in danger of idolatry, and some people, their eyes are blind to it. But let me tell you something. When they're giving glory, to false gods. It's like that movie, Sleeping with the Enemy. We are in bed with false gods. Asleep in bed with false gods. And that giving him the glory. But Moses said to God, Lord, let me see your glory. In the book called A Theology, an article called A Theology of God's Glory, Paul's use of doxa, you know, doxa means as the Greek for glory. Doxa terminology in Romans states that God's glory results from divine revelation and divine works. And in Romans chapter Chapter 6, God's glory raised Jesus from the dead. In other words, I'm saying tonight that God's glory has power. There's power in the glory of God. And I remember a crisis moment, a crisis moment in our history as a Methodist church when things were hot. There was an old local preacher in that church. When things were hot, she raised a hymn and she sang, Jesus is stronger than Satan. Hallelujah and sing. And Jesus saves me now. When we give glory to God, we get new power and we get new strength. Who is the King of Glory? Lift up your heads, O ye gates, even lift them up, ye everlasting doors, and the King of glory shall go in. Who is the King of glory? The Lord strong and mighty, the Lord mighty in battle. He is. Hallelujah. 
And we refuse as a church to bow to any other king. Saying be the king who is coming to reign. Glory to Jesus, the lamb that was slain. Life and salvation, his empire shall bring glory to Jesus. When Jesus is king. And Jesus is willing to share his glory with us. And in John's Gospel, chapter 17, Jesus speaks about how the Father glorified him and how he also put that glory on his apostles and brother Bert. May Jesus glorify you by his Holy Spirit. Receive the Holy Spirit. Be anointed tonight with the power. In the name of Jesus, Hallelujah. be anointed tonight, be our partners. One of our hymns says, how can it be that you would make a slave, a partner of your glory? We are partners of God's glory. And I hasten on to end this sermon. And as I started with Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., so I end. All of us know his last sermon, don't we? The night before he died, you know his sermon, but he preached. He wasn't supposed to preach, but he preached. And he said towards the end of the sermon, I don't know what's going to happen now. 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 And as we look around us in the world, and what's happening in the world, we can say, what is the world coming to? I don't know what's going to happen now. But he said one thing. My eyes, hallelujah, have seen the glory of the coming of the Lord. He is trampling out the vintage with the grapes of wrath. Our sword, he has loosed the faithful lightning of his terrible Swift sword, his truth is marching on. He is sifting. We can pretend all we want. God is sifting. A God to glorify, a never dying soul to save and fit it for the sky. God is going to sift us. I'm going to stand before God. And each one of us will stand before the eternal God and give an account of our short chip. One day, God is marching, but he is a missionary God. He is not marching only to destroy. He is marching to save. Isaiah 63 and verse 1 said, Who is this who comes from Edom? The garments die from Basra. I, marching in my power, mighty to save. And that's Jesus, riding on and bringing glory. And my final word to you tonight, Brother Bert and all of us who are here, he has sounded forth the trumpet that shall never do what? Next year will make me 48 years of travel. I started traveling in 1975 during my third year at seminary, 1975. That's my year of travel, 48 years. Where the time has gone, I don't know. But I know one thing, I shall never call retreat. I told my church in Wesley, Mount Zion, Little Sound last week, but me, when I can't preach no more with my mouth, my heart will preach for me. My heart will still go on. And I close with a reference to the old bulldog himself, Winston Churchill. When he, before he died, he chose him. You know what him he chose? The part of him of the Republic. He said, let them sing. My eyes have seen the glory of the coming. My eyes have seen the glory of the coming of the Lord. 
And one of his most famous quotes is, never surrender. It's never, never surrender. And that's the word I speak tonight. The kingdoms of this world are becoming the kingdoms of our Lord and of his Christ and he shall reign forever. He shall go from strength to strength, uh, uh, change from glory into glory till in heaven we take our place, till we cast our crowns before him, lost in wonder, love and praise. Lord, show us your glory. And may this tabernacle be filled with the presence of the glory of God tonight. And as we leave here tonight, may the glory of God be in every heart. May Jesus Christ, the King of glory, fill your life and bless you. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. 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 What a word. What a word. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Nilly, for the word that you shared tonight. And I pray God will continue to bless you, God continue to keep you as you continue to serve him. Thank you very much for the word. Do you know while Reverend Nilly was preaching, and he just mentioned that he, my eye, my eyes have seen the glory. And I can, I feel that yes. we can see him. Yes. Let us sing the first verse. Of my eyes have seen the glory of the coming of the Lord. Sorry for changing the hymn, but let us sing to the glory of God. Let us serve and sing to the glory of God. My eyes are seeing the glory of the coming of the Lord. to lead us in the prayers of intercession.
The Lord be with you. And also with you. Let us pray. For the church, sisters and brothers in Christ, I ask your prayers for the whole family of God, that God would heal the church from its divisions and guide and strengthen it in its mission. Gracious Father, we pray for the Holy Catholic Church as your instrument, fill it with all truth and all peace. Where it is corrupt, purify it. Where it is an error, direct it. Where in anything it is amiss, reform it. Where it is right, strengthen and confirm it. Where it is in need, provide for it. Where it is divided, granted your healing grace. For the sake of Jesus Christ, your Son, our Savior. Amen. For the MCCA, sisters and brothers in Christ, I ask your prayers for that branch of the church to which we belong, that by the Holy Spirit we may be enabled to reform the nations and to spread scriptural holiness throughout the world. Enabling God, we pray for the Methodist Church in the Caribbean and the Americas, and in particular the Bahamas, Turks and Caicos Islands Conference, for its officers, clergy, and laity, that you may make us instruments for you and your work, boldly proclaiming Jesus Christ in word and deed throughout the conference area. Amen. For those in authority, sisters and brothers in Christ, I ask your prayers for the leaders of state, that God may guide their hearts and minds according to God's will, that all people may live in freedom and peace. Almighty and everlasting God, we humbly implore you graciously to regard your instruments in authority over us in the Bahamas and the Turks and Caicos Islands and their advisors, that guided by your Holy Spirit, they may be high in purpose, wise in counsel, and unwavering in duty, and in the administration of their solemn charge, may wholly serve your will, uphold the honor of our nations, secure the protection of our peoples, and set forward every just cause through your Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. For those in need, sisters and brothers in Christ, I ask your special prayers for those who are in need, that God would look in mercy upon them and grant them the cries of their hearts. We pray, Lord, for all those portion of earthly goods is meager, for all poor and the sick, for all who are forced to live in unfavorable surroundings, in economic distress or physical need, for those who are in prison, for those in our wellness centers and homes for the elderly, for those whose homes are overshadowed by bereavement, anxiety and distress, for those who suffer injustice and oppression, for our families, for our children, for our friends, for those whom we do our daily work, and all with whom we live in daily fellowship, give to your people everywhere the knowledge of the forgiveness of sins and the assurance of salvation, thus making them instruments of your glory, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. The Lord's Prayer.
sitting as we sing, let us break bread together on our knees. service and a respectable time. I invite you to kindly stand with me for the liturgy, for the sacrament of the Lord's Supper. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. Lift your to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is, right and it is a good and pleasant thing, joyful and salutary always and everywhere to give you thanks and praise. Lord God, ever-living, ever-blessed, almighty, all-living, through Jesus Christ, your only Son, our Lord, you created all things and made us in your image. And when uh, we fall into sin, you gave him to be our Savior. He shared our human nature and lived a fully human life. He suffered rejection and condemnation and died on the cross. You raised him up from the dead. And you exalted him to the glory of your right hand, where he reigns forever as priest and king, and makes intercession for us. In witness of his glory and honor, you poured out the Holy Spirit, building up many people into one body, making us living members of your holy church, and enabling us to stand before you to sing your praises and to celebrate your mighty acts. Therefore, with angels and archangels, and with all the company of heaven, we join in a hymn of everlasting praise. Blessed are you, Lord God, King of the universe, and blessed is your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, whom, on the night in which he was betrayed, took bread into his holy hands. 
and looking up to heaven, gave thanks, broke it and gave it to his disciples saying, take this and eat it. This is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way after the supper, Jesus took the cup, gave thanks and gave it to them saying, drink from it all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. Christ died, Christ is risen, Christ will come again. Therefore, Father, in obedience to his command, we do this in remembrance of him, praying that you will accept our sacrifice of praise and thanksgiving. Grant that by the power of the Holy Spirit, we who receive your gifts of bread and wine may share in the body and blood of Christ and become united with him. And as we offer ourselves to you as a living sacrifice, we pray that you will bring us with your whole creation to your heavenly kingdom. This we pray through Jesus Christ our Lord, to hold with you, O Father, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, be all honor and glory to all who dwell on earth and in heaven throughout the ages of ages. Amen. The bread which we break is a sharing in the body of Christ. Amen. The cup of blessing which we bless is a sharing in the blood of Christ. Amen. Amen. Though we are many, we are one Lord, because we share one Lord and partake of the same Please be seated. And as we prepare to come to the table of the Lord this evening, I invite us to share together in the prayer of humble access. Lord, we come to your table, trusting in your mercy and not in any goodness of our own. We are not worthy to gather the crumbs under your table, but it is your nature always to have mercy, and on that we depend. So feed us with the body and blood of Jesus Christ, your Son, that we may forever live in him and be in us. Amen. Amen. I am going to invite if uh, our ministers can uh, first come after we will receive the sacrament here. The ministers and then the, the family of Bert, along with Bert, to come. And uh, then uh, I will invite the remaining members of the congregation choir and then the remaining members of the congregation to please join us.
together in the final prayer of thanksgiving as we bring to an end this communion aspect of the service, our post-communion prayer, and we share together. And we thank, thank you, Lord, Lord that you have fed us in this sacrament, united us with Christ, and you gave us our forecast of the heavenly banquet. Prepare it for all mankind. And now, my brothers and sisters, I invite you to stand as we sing our closing hymn, O Thou Who Killest from Above. Sister Colita Lightborn, uh, the Reverend Bishop C.B. Moss, a good friend of mine who is still soldiering on, fighting the good fight of faith. We want to continue to pray for God's healing and God's restoration in his life as we continue to believe God after his experience just a few short days ago. We pray God's healing power over him as he remains in hospital at this time. We receive now the benediction. And now may the Lord bless us and keep us. May the Lord make his face shine upon us and be gracious unto us. May the Lord lift up the light of his countenance upon us and may God grant us peace, the grace of our Lord and the Savior Jesus Christ, the love of God and the sweet fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us now and forevermore. Amen, amen, and amen, amen.